These leaves are afflicted with a terrible disease that slowly sucks the life from the plant. If the victim were a human, their skin would have the same pattern, but of rotting, dead flesh. Scientists called this disease tobacco mosaic. At the end of the 19th century, biologist Dmitry Ivanovsky decided at all costs to find the bacterium that causes it. However, while filtering the juice of plants, he stumbled upon something never seen before. The filter, which could stop all known microbes, was powerless against the causative agent of the tobacco mosaic, and it continued to infect more and more new bushes. So it was something much smaller than a bacterium, but much more dangerous. This was how humanity first discovered a new enemy viruses. And even though we've already seen them under a microscope, these little death machines continue to kill us. In this video, you'll find out how did humanity fight against viruses without even knowing what they were? Why do many scientists consider viruses not to be alive? And most importantly, how can we win the war against viruses? What were our first known battles with viruses? In 1485, a terrifying and mysterious disease came to England. Victims suffered from inexorable thirst and delirium while sweating profusely. Every second person died in terrible agony. This incurable disease called English sweating sickness terrorized locals for 70 years, and only modern scientists finally discovered that English sweating sickness was caused by the hantavirus. There could be no question of any cure for it at that time, as natural selection was fully functional. However, in another mortal battle, we were able to fight back without even knowing the true nature of our enemy. Namely, a disease that's haunted humankind for thousands of years. Every third person died from it, and it left survivors with deep, indelible scars and often complete blindness. Moreover, when Europeans brought this affliction to the Americas, it killed over 90% of the native population. That disease was smallpox. But in 1796, a hundred years before the discovery of viruses, an English doctor named Edward Jenner found a weak spot in the fearsome, seemingly invulnerable killer. He found that milkmaids infected with the non-lethal cowpox didn't get human smallpox later. Jenner decided on an unheard of experiment. He rubbed the pus of a sick milkmaid into the scratches on an eight-year-old boy's arm and then tried to infect him with human smallpox. The doctor risked killing the child, but his incredible cure worked. The boy didn't get sick, and humanity received its first protection against a virus, a vaccine. But if we hope to win not only a battle, but also the war, we'll need to study the enemy carefully and understand where it came from. How did viruses actually become our enemies? Many biologists don't consider them alive, and not surprisingly, these microscopic killers aren't able to live on their own after all. All they consist of is just a wad of genetic material inside a thin protein shell. But when entering inside any living cell, including a human one, they reveal their nature as an ideal death machine. Viruses palm off their blueprints, DNA or RNA, into a cell's protein factories. Eventually, the hapless victim begins to produce millions of copies of their killer. And while the body reacts and tries to stop the replication started by this hacker, entire armies will roll off the assembly line, ready to capture more and more new cells. But how did viruses even learn such a devilish trick? Scientists have three main hypotheses. The ancestors of viruses could be living parasitic cells. After settling firmly in other cells, they gradually shed everything superfluous. It's like a xenomorph who no longer needs food or air to live. This is the regressive theory of the origin of viruses. Alternatively, they might have been formed from free genetic chains which somehow gained the ability to parasitize cells. It's like Skynet from Terminator, which was a simple program, but gained a murderous will over time. 
This is what the progressive origin theory says. But maybe viruses arose at the same time as living cells and developed along with them. This scenario is called coevolution. In any case, it's not possible to look into the past and see the first virus. After all, their pace of evolution is orders of magnitude faster than ours. Regular old influenza, the flu virus, changes at such speed that all the strains that people had just a hundred years years ago have died out and disappeared without a trace. And the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, is a thousand times more volatile than the flu. Samples taken from the same patient only a few months apart already contain dozens of differences. But will all of our current knowledge of viruses help us deal with the deadliest of them? How do we fight against the most dangerous viruses? This pathogen has caused 26 epidemic outbreaks in Africa so far. Having caught it, you may at first think you have the flu, high fever, gradually increasing headache and weakness, and possible muscle and joint pain. But soon enough, you'll start bleeding right from your eyes, ears, and nose. Such hellish symptoms are caused by the deadly Ebola virus. Having gotten sick, it's like tossing a coin. 50% chance you'll live, 50% you'll die. There's no cure, only vaccines for several types of Ebola. The virus enters the body through the blood or from contact with other fluids from an infected body. So if you're traveling in Africa, wash your hands more often and avoid wild animals. After all, the virus can freely develop in animals and then jump to a human. For this next virus, it's enough if an infected animal doesn't bite you but simply scratches you. The symptoms at first will also resemble regular old influenza. But soon, you'll begin to feel growing anxiety and hyperreactivity. You want to hide indoors and tightly close all the windows because the slightest puff of wind in your face will make you shiver with intense fear. And if you try to drink a glass of water, you won't be able to do it. The very sight of the liquid will cause you to react with horror and fear of drowning. That's how the rabies virus infects the human brain. The only way to save your life is to inject the vaccine immediately after an animal bite, but before the first symptoms appear. But if viruses are so powerful and invincible, could we turn their own power against them? Is it possible for a virus to change its behavior? These death machines can easily manipulate their victims. The cucumber mosaic virus does more than just use the cells of the infected organism to copy itself. The program of this genetic machine causes the plant to exude an odor that attracts aphids. This shrewd manipulator is basically calling a taxi for itself because the aphids then transport the virus to new plants where the cycle repeats. But some viral puppeteers have gone even further. Baculovirus has chosen moth caterpillars and butterflies as its victims. It somehow makes infected caterpillars forget about reproducing and convinces them to eat continuously. And the virus feeds along with the victims. Having depleted the factory of each host cell to the limit, the baculovirus flips some kind of a switch and makes the caterpillar want to crawl up in into the light higher and higher. And finally, it commands the victim to produce an enzyme that dissolves it from the inside. As a result, infected clumps of caterpillars fall from above in a terrible rain, which then infects others. It's a true biological weapon. And although now the baculovirus is dangerous only for caterpillars, who says that a hundred years from now, mutations won't turn it into a killing machine for humans as well? But what if we strike a step ahead of that and be the first to resort to manipulation? Scientists already have some viruses in mind, which perhaps will become the weapon of humankind in the last battle, not to life but to the death. 
This is the Sputnik virophage that dwells inside giant viruses. It uses the primary weapon of the deadly machines against them. The Sputnik rewrites the genetic blueprints of a giant virus, forcing the infected cell to produce not its own DNA, but that of the Sputniks. And if virophages are capable of this in nature, perhaps someday scientists will be able to synthesize special forces detachments of virophages. They'll be harmless to humans, but deadly to other viruses. Checkmate. Over the years, scientists have found more and more traces of our past successful battles with viruses, and they were so cruel that they left scars on the human genome itself. Approximately 8% of our DNA is fragments of viruses that affected not only people, but also our distant ancestors in the animal kingdom. So, it turns out that we're gradually turning into the monsters we're fighting against. Check out this video to learn more about other vicious organisms we should worry about. Will this slime mold found in an ancient Egyptian tomb destroy humanity?